Good Sunday afternoon, students. Professor Hank Lewis again with Lone Star College, HCC, and the University of Phoenix, among other places. Uh, today we are doing a video about what happens when there's a shift in market supply or a shift in market demand and how that impacts the market equilibrium. Uh, previous video, we were dealing with the math models that were explaining uh, what is supply, what is demand, and how do we find an equilibrium price and quantity. But one of the things that always comes up is why is the price of gas suddenly so expensive in Texas and how come it's hard to find? Well, the simple matters of the movement of the supply or the demand curve is the reason why prices rise and drop for products. It's the reason why quantities that are bought and sold either get bigger or get smaller. Uh, the actual shifting of the supply and demand curve. So we're going to go to the PowerPoint slideshow. I'm going to share the screen. Okay, let me get one moment here to get this thing together. Bear with me here and share. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, I'm sorry if I made anybody dizzy here with that. Okay, we had previously learned about market supply, market demand, and market equilibrium. Uh, the equilibrium point is visually the intersection of the supply and the demand curve. It's the point in the market at which we have some price, and P star is a symbol we use for that, where the quantity demanded, QD, is equal to the quantity supplied, QS, which we call Q star, equilibrium quantity. Now, I mentioned with the fact that as long as there's no outside force interfering with the market, it will naturally clear at an equilibrium point. Even if new products released are over or underpriced in the market, the old invisible hand, the interaction of buyers and sellers are going to move that market towards equilibrium and it'll all work out fairly nicely. Uh, however, the last statement at the bottom of the slideshow says quite clearly, if there is a change, meaning a parallel shift left or right in the market supply or the market demand curve, within a reasonable amount of time, the market will adjust to a new equilibrium point with a higher or lower equilibrium price and a bigger or smaller equilibrium quantity. And so we need to talk about what makes those curves move around. Now, first thing I need to talk about is that when there is a change in supply or demand, the graphs are going to shift parallel either left or right. They will not, I repeat, not shift parallel up or down, okay? An increase means a shift to the right. Now, the reason why that's the case is, remember, this is the Cartesian plane. Remember, the farther you go to the right horizontally, the larger those values are. And so when demand shifts to the right, what is happening is at any price that could be charged, for some reason, consumers want to buy and consume more of the product. Similarly, when there's an increase in supply, it shifts to the right. What's happening is no matter what price would be charged, businesses are willing and able to produce and sell more of the product. And that is at any price, at every price that is reasonable to be charged. Now, on the flip side, a decrease in demand is defined as a leftward shift because the quantities get smaller. Notice how they're heading towards zero on the positive side here, okay, as we head left horizontally. So when demand or supply decreases, we are saying that at every possible price that could be charged, in the case of demand, people don't want to buy as much of the product. No matter how expensive or how cheap the product is, people don't want to buy as much. And if the supply curve is shifting left, okay, what's happening is businesses cannot produce and sell as much of the product. No matter how high the price is, no matter how low the price is, businesses cannot produce and sell as much. But the critical piece here, you see dead center. In each case, you need to pay attention. What is happening to the equilibrium price when supply shifts right? Or what is happening to the equilibrium price when the supply shifts right? And I should have said demand for that first one. My apologies. What happens to equilibrium price when demand shifts right? What happens to equilibrium price when the supply shifts right? And what about the quantity? What happens to the equilibrium quantity when demand shifts right? What happens to the equilibrium quantity when the supply shifts right? And we also want to know the same thing. What happens to the equilibrium price when the supply shifts left? What happens to the equilibrium price when the demand shifts left? What happens to the equilibrium quantity when supply shifts left? What happens to the equilibrium quantity when demand shifts left? The resultant impact on that equilibrium point, the change in the price and the quantity, is the stuff that we actually observe as we're dealing with things in our normal daily activities as consumers, or if some of you or your families own and operate businesses as producers and sellers in the market. Now, of course, we need to know what makes demand and supply shift left or right. And the first thing I say is this. If we're looking at the market for a particular product, like say gasoline, 
The price of gasoline does not make supply change and it does not make demand change. Class, the supply and the demand determine the original equilibrium price. Excuse me a second here, y'all. And so the thing is, the price of a product can't move the curve. The price of the product is part of the supply curve. It's part of the demand curve. So it's some other factor related to production that makes supply move. And it's some other factor related to the consumers that makes the demand move, but it's not the price of the product itself that is making the supplier demand curve move. It could be the price in the case of supply, and I'll say cost in this case, of a resource that's used to make the product. It could have to deal with how many businesses are producing and selling the product. Or in the case of consumers, it could be the price of a different produced product that is related in consumption, or it could be about the consumer's tastes and preferences. And in fact, we have two laundry lists of shifters, or more properly called, non-price determinants for demand and supply. And these are the factors that make these curves shift left or shift right. Now, most textbooks have the list that I have with the exception of one entity, and I'm gonna talk about that next, sunspot activity. Some textbooks have it, some don't. I like to have a complete list. Sunspot activity in general refers to unexpected changes in the weather or unusual events. Now, if the unexpected change in the weather or unusual events are gonna mainly impact the consumers, the end users, those who buy and use a product, we call it demand side sunspot activity. An example, the demand for gasoline in parts of Texas shifted very far to the right. It increased a ton because people had this belief, although false, that there'd be this massive shortage of gasoline. On the other hand, somebody does something stupid, like a famous actor or actress or singer does something really, really stupid that's offensive to a lot of people, suddenly the demand for their movies, their music shifts very far to the left. And if that actor or actress had just had a better publicist or handler and had not done that stuff, then everything would have been okay. But those are examples of demand side sunspot activity. Now, if the unexpected change in the weather or the unusual event mainly impacts the producers of a product, it's called supply side sunspot activity. Again, Hurricane Harvey has shut down several major refineries which produce and sell gasoline. And so the supply of gasoline has shifted somewhat to the left. If it had not been for the hurricane, the supply of gasoline would have remained unchanged. And so that would be a form of supply side sunspot activity. Or think about how a severe drought could cause crop failure and cause the supply of certain products like are made from corn, for example, or wheat. Those are water intensive uh, crops. If there's a severe drought, the supply of wheat and corn will shift to the left. But on the flip side, sometimes you get unquestionably fair weather that helps grow more crops and that could cause supply to shift to the right. Or sometimes resources we thought were rare turn out not to be so rare. Uh, Napoleon used to eat from an aluminum plate because back then aluminum was more scarce than gold. However, when somebody figured out a way through electromagnetism to extract aluminum from dirt, it was suddenly realized aluminum is super duper common. And so we use aluminum for beer and soda cans today and gold is still reserved for jewelry. The whole thing is if somebody had not discovered that aluminum was common through this method here, it would have remained considered like a desirable metal. Irony of ironies, eh? Now, let's talk about shifting the demand curve. We've already talked about demand side sunspot activity, but I want you to take a look at these other items. Notice consumers plural possessive shows up at least three times. Consumers is a noun, number of consumers plural is mentioned. And the price of other goods that are related in consumption. Remember, demand is the force that is associated with the buyers and end users. And most students relate to demand a lot more. Something becomes popular, demand shifts to the right because of a change in taste and preferences. Something is now considered out of style, and I don't mean in an ironic hipster way, but it's considered no longer fashionable, then the demand shifts to the left because of taste and preferences. Similarly, consumers' expectations of the future. One could argue that consumers were expecting gasoline to be scarce and that made gasoline increase in the present. They wanted to stock up now before there was a shortage, and irony of ironies, they end up causing one. On the flip side, though, sometimes consumers expect a product is going to be available much more plentifully in the future and they may wait. Or maybe they expect the price will drop in the future. Like if you're looking to buy a new car and you think, you know what, if I wait till the end of the model year, three months from now, I could probably save a few thousand dollars. You're not going to buy the car now, but that's just you. Suppose a really large group, like say like one third of the consumers in the market for new cars think if we wait until October at the end of the model year, we'll be able to get 
uh, much, much cheaper price in those cars. The demand for cars right now in September could shift left because they're expecting prices to drop. Please keep in mind, just because you expect something to happen doesn't mean it will. Okay, a lot of y'all who have been dating people might say, tell me about that, Professor. <laughs> okay, moving along here, consumers' income levels. Class, not all products are income sensitive. In fact, some products are considered income neutral. Income neutral products, their demand will not be affected by changes in income. However, some products are called income related or income sensitive products and a change in the income level of a large group of the population, either increasing or reduction, can shift the demand. Some products demand shifts left when income goes up. Other products demand shifts right when income goes up. And we have them in three classifications, but we group them according to how demand behaves. By the way, it's also vice versa if income levels drop. So let's talk about inferior goods first of all. Inferior goods are defined as products that fill a basic need but are not desirable to most consumers. Think about a beat up old used car. It supplies basic transportation, but most people don't want to drive a car that's got faulty brakes, more duct tape than hose, and the smell of something that happened in the back seat that you can't quite identify. But the whole thing is this. If people's income are gonna drop, People are beggars that can't be choosers. They're going to buy more old used cars, okay? But if income levels rise, why would I buy a beat-up old used car that smells bad if I can afford to buy at least a certified pre-owned car that smells like it's new? And so that's where we kind of draw the distinction. Now, normal and superior goods are grouped together because their demand behaves the same way. When income levels rise, the demand for normal goods shifts right and the demand for superior goods shifts right and they will shift left when income levels drop. But here's the kicker about normal and superior goods, okay? Normal goods and superior goods are not the same type of product. A normal good is a product that fills a basic need and is desirable to most consumers. I would rather have a brand new Honda Civic than a beat up old 20 year old Honda Accord, okay? And so the thing is the normal good is essentially Still not that expensive necessarily, but it's desirable. It's much more preferable. Now, a superior good is a luxury product. A brand new Acura, a brand new Cadillac Escalade would be considered a superior good. Okay? And so the thing is, if we had a sudden drop in income levels, the demand for inferior goods would shift right. The demand for normal or superior goods would shift left and vice versa. Now, with number six, Prices of other goods related in consumption, here's what the situation is. We have two different products, A and B. Product A and B have a relationship in consumption if the price of product B causes the demand for product A, a different product, to shift left or right. And there's different kinds of relationships in consumption. Now, let me add something here. Some products are totally unrelated to consumption. If the price of gasoline goes up or goes down, it has no impact on the demand for milk whatsoever because demand uh, for milk and the demand for gasoline have no relationship. Milk and gasoline have zero relationship in how the end users consume them. Okay. However, products like, say, Xbox gaming software and Xbox consoles, those have a strong relationship in consumption. And they would actually be what we call complementary goods. Now, let me clarify something that your textbooks does not do the best job of. Some products are very strongly complementary in consumption. I call them strictly complementary, as in at least one product is useless for the intended purpose without the others. An Xbox disc that has the software for Forza Motorsport 6 is unusable without the Xbox One console. It's also unusable without a TV, a controller, batteries, and electricity, okay? But the main relationship I'm talking about is the gaming software and the console, okay? Those products are strictly complementary in consumption. The gaming software is unusable for the intended purpose without the console. Now, if somebody has a console and a controller, electricity, and a TV, they can go ahead and use the Xbox One for other stuff, especially if they have an internet connection. They can watch Netflix. They can actually do some other things. There's a built-in software that comes with some versions of the console. But that gaming disc is not usable for the intended purpose to play the game without having the console. So here's how this would work. The price of the console could go up or go down, and that would affect the demand for the games. 
Okay. I don't know why the price of the console will go up or go down. I don't give a rat's patootie. The question is, how does the price of the Xbox One affect the demand and affect the market equilibrium for the gaming software? Think about it for a second. If consoles suddenly drop in price, like the Xbox One X gets released, Scorpio as some people call it, and originally they announced it'll be $600, but when it's released they say, you know what, we're going to drop the price to $400. I can guarantee you the demand for any software and peripherals that would be used with that Xbox One X Scorpio, whatever you want to call it, would shift to the right because the price of the console dropped, people are going to buy the stuff that goes with it. Okay. Uh, some people may have bought, for example, like a country club membership, and then they end up buying nicer clothes and a bunch of golf clubs and stuff like that and so forth. Those would be semi-complementary goods, that kind of thing. Now, some products are what we call weekly complementary. In other words, a lot of people use the products together out of habit, but one product is perfectly usable without the other. It is possible to use bacon without eggs. There's all kinds of great uses for bacon. Similarly, you can use eggs to do all kinds of things, and you don't need the bacon to use the eggs. A lot of people consume them together, but they are not strictly complementary. So if the price of bacon goes up or goes down, it'll have zero impact on the demand for eggs because the eggs have so many uses that don't require the bacon and vice versa. So it's only the strictly complementary goods, one product is useless without the other, where the price of one product will shift the demand for the other when we're talking about the relationship. Now, the other relationship products could have in consumption are called substitutes of consumption in class. This is a formal name. Do not drop the full phrase. Do not say substitute goods because there are also substitutes in production. And those substitutes don't move the demand curve. They move the supply curve. So if you mean substitutes of consumption, you better say substitutes in consumption. Now, two or more products are called substitutes of consumption if a consumer is able to use one product in the place of the other. And your textbook does a fabulous job of explaining that some products are close substitutes of consumption, while others are poor substitutes of consumption. I'm a coffee drinker. I prefer to use half and half in my coffee in the morning. However, I keep a jar of Cremora powdered coffee creamer in the event I suddenly run out of half and half and I don't have time to go to the grocery store. It is not the best substitute consumption, but I prefer it to drinking black coffee. I prefer to have some cream in my coffee, and so I've got the emergency stash of Cremora in there. It is a close substitute consumption. It's not a great substitute, but it's not bad. Another example. Suppose you were trying to stir fry a bunch of vegetables to make maybe some kind of soup or some kind of a dish for your family. And suppose you are out of canola oil. Well, you could use olive oil, you could use butter, you could use margarine, you could use coconut oil. There's a plethora of different products that could be used for cooking vegetables in a stir fry uh, besides canola oil. And so the thing is, if it's very easy to use one product in the place of the other, those products are close substitutes of consumption. However, the more difficult it is to use one product in the place of the other, the poorer, P-O-O-R-E-R, -O -O -E -R, they are as substitutes. And so the thing is, butter and margarine are always used as very close substitutes. Most people will take whatever's on the table if they're using it as a spread for their waffles and pancakes. If you're frying or baking, it says one tablespoon butter or margarine. It's just that they're not the same product. Butter is made from churned cream from an animal's milk, typically cows or goats. And margarine is hydrogenated vegetable oil that has been dyed yellow and given some artificial flavoring to make it taste and resemble butter more, but it is not the same thing. But they are reasonably close substitutes of consumption. And so here's the deal. If the price of butter were to say go up a lot, like suddenly it costs $6 for four quarter pound sticks of butter, a lot more people would buy margarine, which is already typically cheaper than butter, like four quarter pound sticks of I can't believe it's not butter would be about a buck compared to $6. Uh, for the real butter here, and so people will buy more margarine. The demand for margarine will shift right as the price of butter goes up. And so I've got two examples here, and again, I prefer to start off with gray pencil or black pen. That's what the black stuff represents, and I really prefer that when you're shifting curves, you use blue, and we're going to go through some examples in a minute. But the thing is, the stuff you see in black is the original equilibrium. And so I've got some examples of shifting demand right and shifting demand left. So this here is the market for 80s retro fashion, and this thing here should really be a dollar sign, not a P. Suppose that all else being equal, 80 styles of clothing are now in fashion again in the present. Well, something becoming in fashion would suggest consumers want to buy more of them, so the demand shifts to the right. 
The reason, this is a change in the consumer's taste and preferences. These items are more popular. Popularity relates to taste and preferences. Now, this is time-lapse photography. This thing does not shift very far to the right two seconds later. Try several months or several weeks after it's noticed they're more popular. The demand curve shifts to the right. And then notice here the new equilibrium point is now diagonally up and to the right. And notice the new equilibrium price, P prime, is farther from zero, vertically higher than P star, so the equilibrium price is rising, it's increasing, getting bigger. Similarly, the new equilibrium quantity, which is labeled here as Q prime, notice it's farther to the right than Q star, the original equilibrium quantity. So the equilibrium price and quantity are both increasing. Please notice nothing is affecting supply. The supply curve is staying put. But notice because demand shifted to the right, businesses are producing and selling more of the product. It's just that the impact is because of the shift in demand. Okay, the price is higher, businesses produce and sell more, people buy and consume more. One curve moves, but the entire market, both sides of the market are affected to the change in the equilibrium. Now here's a different example here. The stuff that's in black, again, is original position here, and the original equilibrium price is P star, the original equilibrium quantity is Q star. Okay, and so it says all else being equal, consumers that are looking to buy a new house expect interest rates and mortgages to drop by half a percent. Class half a percent or 50 basis points to use financial lingo could save a person tens of thousands of dollars in interest charges over the life of a 20 to 30 year mortgage. And so if somebody's looking to buy a house, they're gonna pay attention to those interest rates. Now, most people I know have to get a mortgage. A mortgage is a loan that's used to buy a house, if you didn't know. And they're gonna get the mortgage in order to get the house, and so that makes them complimentary goods. But the thing is, it did not say the interest rates have dropped right now. It says consumers expect interest rates to drop by half a percent, not today, but six months in the future. As somebody who's bought a couple of houses, I can tell you, if I think that interest rates are gonna drop six months in the future, I'm not buying a house today. If a lot of people looking to buy a house believe this, they're gonna come look at some houses, make some notes, but they're not gonna be making any offers because they believe the interest rates will drop in six months. The thing is, it doesn't matter if the interest rates really drop in six months or not, if enough consumers believe they will drop and don't buy houses, the end result is the demand curve shifts to the left from the original position labeled with D's to the new positions labeled as D prime. That little apostrophe is always read as a prime, just FYI. So the demand shifts horizontally to the left, but notice again, this is time-lapse photography. We see a diagonal down to the left movement of the equilibrium point. Notice the new equilibrium price P prime is closer to zero than the original P star was. We see a drop in the equilibrium price of a house. So the asking prices will start to go down. At the same time, notice real estate agents and title companies won't be closing on as many deals here. Notice the equilibrium quantity Q prime, the new one is closer to zero than the old one. The number of houses both bought and sold decrease. Again, there's no change in supply. It's because demand is shifting left, we see a drop in the price, and we see less products, or less of these houses probably be bought and sold. So keep that in mind here. These are just two examples. Now, demand is not the only curve that can shift. Market supply can shift as well. It's just in the case of market supply, it's different factors that affect it. Supply is related to producers. And again, we talked about supply side sunspot activity already, but I want you to notice here, a lot of this other stuff relates to production. Numbers two, three, and four, and I don't want you to use numbers, please use your words, y'all. Changes in costs of necessary resources. Those are the materials used to make a product. Changes in technological base of the industry, the available technology that can be used to manufacture a product. And then changes in government factors affecting, notice again, production costs in the industry. All three of these items here are related to the cost and the means of productions to actually make something here. And then the others, notice producers parallel possessive, number of producers as a noun, number of businesses making and selling a product, and the price of other goods related in production. Everything related to supply deals with production. We talked about how especially agricultural products are sensitive to changes in the weather, but there's also other weirdness that can affect uh, production as well that we call supply side sunspot activity. 
Resources, remember, those are the ingredients we could like to say that are used to make and sell goods and services. The cost of things like flour, eggs, and butter will affect the price of baking bread or baking cakes or making cookies here. The cost of labor used to manufacture different types of goods and services will affect the supply of them as well. The general rule of thumb is that when resource costs increase, supply shifts left. There's less production because businesses typically have fixed operating uh, budgets, especially in the short run. And so an, a sudden increase in the cost of resources will make supply shift left. On the other hand, a sudden drop in the cost of resources means businesses operating with fixed budgets will be able to buy more resources or hire more resources and therefore produce more. So a drop in resource costs makes supply shift to the right. Technology. The technological base is the available technology that can be used to produce a product. Technological base typically only does one thing, improve, or it stays the same. If technology stays the same, no impact on supply. When technology improves, that means that businesses will be able to produce more output forevermore once they acquire and put into use the new technology. Yes, there is a one-time cost to upgrade the technology, but that cost is not perpetual. It's a single time. For technology to be worth implementing, which means put into use, it has to reduce your cost of production forevermore. My dentist, Dr. Nathaniel Tippett, about six years ago, put in digital x-ray imaging equipment. And the thing is, it used to take 40 minutes to service a client. It reduced the time to about 20 minutes because you weren't waiting 20 minutes for x-rays to develop. So that meant a hygienist who would normally service, on average, three clients every two hours can now service three clients an hour. So what Dr. Tippett did with this new technology was he spent $50,000 on each new imaging equipment piece. And so he spent about a million dollars to buy 20 of those things. What ended up happening was he was able to service twice as many clients a day at all of his locations and service them faster and make them happier, of course. And what ended up happening was supply of available dental appointments shifted to the right. It enabled more production, okay? Now, excise and sales taxes, these are not income taxes. I repeat, not income taxes. An excise tax is charged when a product is produced at the point of production. Beer, wine, tobacco products, spirits like whiskey and vodka have an excise tax. An excise tax is like a toll gate on a market where you cannot sell one single drop of beer, wine, or whiskey if you don't pay the toll first, like five cents per 12 ounces or five dollars per keg and stuff like that. I have friends who own small breweries in the Houston area, and excise taxes are things they have to budget for. They can't buy as much hops, barley, and water, and malt, and yeast. They cannot pay as many workers to brew beer because they have to be mindful of every drop we make is subject to excise tax. We have to plan for it. And so if the government starts raising excise taxes, there's less beer and less spirits made. If they lower them, the exact opposite. Sales taxes are not a demand factor. They are a supply factor because consumers are not required by law to pay them. Surprise, no. Retail businesses that sell products that are subject to sales tax are required by law to pay them, but it is the seller, not the buyer, who is responsible and is therefore a cost of production to the seller. Class, here's the bottom line here. The retail price that a seller will charge for a product includes the wholesale price, plus a markup where they make their profit margin, plus the sales tax. That's the price that you pay, but the seller doesn't get to keep the sales tax. Something that costs $100 base price in Houston will cost $108.25, or its final amount paid by the consumer will be $108.25, but guess what? The seller doesn't keep $108.25. The seller only keeps $100. That $8.25 goes to the city of Houston, Harris County, and the state of Texas. And so they don't get any benefit from this. And in fact, maybe they could have sold the product for $103 instead of $100 if it wasn't for the sales tax because they have to sell enough of the product to make some money to make it worth their while. And so they're charging a lower base price because they have to cover the sales tax cost yet still sell enough product to make it worth their while. So sales taxes are just as much a cost of production as excise taxes are. Everybody repeat, costs go up, supply go left. Costs go down, supply go right. That simple. 
Subsidies. The macro students have heard about this. This is where the government is making efforts to intentionally reduce the cost of production to businesses. If the government starts putting in more subsidies, what ends up happening is that businesses get this extra cash coming in for them to buy resources and pay for production so they don't have to take as much of their own money to spend on it. More subsidies to an industry like, say, Lone Star College. We get subsidies in the form of tax money from the, the districts and the federal government and financial aid. When there's more of these subsidies made available, it reduces our operating costs and enables the supply of classes to shift to the right. If the government suddenly started cutting back on those subsidies to Lone Star College or HCC or any university, they would have to spend more of their, mo of their own money, pardon me, to operate the college and they would therefore book fewer classes and you would have more students in each class. They'd be bigger classes and fewer of them. And so the end result here is subsidies are like the opposite of an excise tax. Now regulations actually cost money because there are what you call compliance costs. To follow the rules sometimes means you have to reconstruct part of your business, like to retrofit a restroom for handicapped people, for example, or to put in a disabled access parking space for a van requires two normal spaces, and so you have fewer pay spaces for your customers to park, and you have to hire somebody to repaint the parking lot. Whenever the government puts in new rules that apply to businesses, and again, I'm not saying that they have bad intentions. I think safety regulations and access rules are a good thing. The question is what's reasonable? What's enough to make sure all customers are serviced reasonably well, but don't encumber businesses unnecessarily? Where is that happy medium, I ask y'all? And there's no easy answer to that. But if the government keeps changing the rules, the cost of following the rules stays high, and that's less money for businesses to acquire materials and hire people to produce things. If the government changes them very, very rarely, compliance costs drop, and so then more money can be devoted to production. Similarly, the longer the government makes their list, if they keep adding new rules every few months, compliance costs stay high, supply moves left. If they change them, or they keep, if they keep the list very short, I should say, then that's going to make compliance costs drop over time. And then last but not least, how complicated are the rules? If the rules are straightforward in plain English and don't require, shall we say, a lawyer to help interpret them, then the simpler they are, the lower the compliance costs are. If the government simplifies the rules or keeps them simple, that's a good thing. It makes costs drop, supply goes right. But if the government makes really complicated rules that have long paragraphs and subsection, use all kinds of legalese and jargon, where you have to hire a lawyer, average price for a lawyer, $150 an hour. In order to figure out what you have to do to follow them, then that's going to drive costs up and supplies left. The whole point here is that any of these four government factors, depending upon how they are executed, could make costs of production rise or drop, which could make supply move left or right. Now, the other three shifters for supply are non-price determinants of supply that are not costs. Producers' expectations of the future. Have y'all noticed how certain toys show up in Walmart and Target months before the, uh, the movie ever comes out? The reason why they show up early is because the manufacturers of the licensed merchandise believe this movie is going to be profitable. It's going to be popular and therefore will sell a lot of related merchandise. The problem is you have to buy the licenses in advance and in order to basically have the shelf space at Target for Christmas, you have to put it out there three months in advance. And so the thing is, if you start seeing like the Last Jedi merchandise right now is showing up at stores, the reason why is the sellers of Star Wars merchandise expect that come later this year when the Last Jedi comes out, it's going to make a lot of money and therefore they will make a lot of money. Supply in the present is increasing because they are anticipating big sales in the future. I have seen other times where businesses discontinued products because they thought they would not be popular in the future, and so the supply started decreasing because they're thinking, why should we produce the product if it's not going to sell? In 2008, a large number of car companies reduced, right in the middle of the model year, the number of cars they were planning to produce because they were expecting the economy to do poorly and the demand for cars to shift left. And they actually were correct to do this, but they didn't decrease the supply of cars months before the recession hit because they were in anticipation of slow sales. Now, a number of producers in the market is very straightforward. Class, we've got four major suppliers of cell phone service, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, Nextel, and T-Mobile. Well, suppose 
a new company. Suppose Rogers Communications, which does cell phones in Canada, all of a sudden gets an FCC license and they start setting up kiosks all over the United States and they start making their cell phone service available to compete with them. That's going to be one new provider of cell phone service which means the supply of cell phone services would shift to the right because there's more producers. On the flip side, suppose Sprint, Nextel, and T-Mobile merge, and so we have one firm exit the market, and there's now only three suppliers of cell phone service. Folks, you have one less supplier of cell phone service. There's going to be less provided. Supply will shift to the left for the same reason. Okay. Now, last but not least, the products related in production. Joint goods. Two or more products are called joint goods if they are manufactured together at the same time. Class, let me give you a couple of examples of joint goods. A cow, a mature female cow about nine years old, has 100 different products that would come from the cow's body. Okay, that's why when a cow that is raised healthily is sold at the rodeo for auction, it makes so much money. Okay, there's a hundred different products that come from that cow. Beef being the obvious one, whether it's for steaks or hamburgers, but you've also got collagen, which is used in makeup and in lotions, among other things. You've got connective tissue that's used to make stuff like glue. You've got gelatin, which is used to make jello and the non vegetarian version of jello. You have got, uh, pardon me, the hide, which is used to make leather, like for shoes and boots and jackets and whatnot. Uh, you've also got the hair, which is used for makeup brushes and paint brushes and that's just six of the products that come from the cow here's the thing if I was a rancher and I had a whole herd of cattle one thing you need to understand about cows is they are high maintenance animals an adult female cow drinks 40 gallons of water a day she needs a couple of pastures of land to walk around and graze for the sake of being healthy and I'm not talking about one of those factory style farms I mean a normal properly run ranch the whole thing is I'm also probably paying for cow feed on top of that, maybe sometimes having to get some purified water in, you know, to the barn and so forth. I'm spending a lot of money to maintain this herd. But if I all of a sudden take a look at the news, look at the commodity market from the Chicago Board of Trade, and I see the price of wholesale leather that's being sold by tanneries is skyrocketing, I'm going to look at my herd and say, you know what, about 10 of those cows would look much better as a pair of rovers. It's a pair of cowboy boots to some of y'all who aren't from Texas. And so what's going to happen is that rancher, a lot of other ranchers, will probably sell more cattle to slaughterhouses. Sorry to be gross about it, y'all. But here's what's funny. The price of leather went up, more cattle get slaughtered, and guess what happens? The supply of beef shifts to the right. The supply of gelatin and collagen shifts to the right. The supply of hair for makeup brushes and the supply of glue shift to the right. The supply of the other 99 products other than leather shift to the right because more cattle got slaughtered because the price of one product, leather, a joint good with those other 99, has increased. Now, substitutes in production. A lot of students say it's very difficult to understand, and I will try to explain it as clearly as I can. Two or more products are called substitutes in production if a business is able to manufacture and sell one product in the place of manufacturing and selling another product. In other words, it's not the consumer using a product in the place of the other. A business is making a product instead of making another product. That's the idea. Now, class, a lot of businesses have multiple products. They don't sell just one product. Apple doesn't just make computers. They make laptop computers, tablet computers. They make media players and cell phones. And the reason why they do this is because not everybody wants to use the same kind of product, but also it allows them to adapt to changing markets. For example, if the, the demand for cell phones keeps going up, if the price of cell phones keeps rising because demand keeps rising, you know what Apple's going to start doing? They're going to start calling their factories and say, hey, buddy, make fewer iPads. Take one of the assembly lines making iPads and now make more iPhones. Take one of the assembly lines making MacBooks and instead move it over to making iPhones. But I want you to understand what's going to happen. If they start rededicating their factory assembly lines more towards iPhones, the supply of MacBooks, the supply of iPads, the supply of the other products made by Apple will shift to the left because they're going to try to make more of the phones. But the only way to make more phones is to make fewer of the other products. So they will substitute the phones on the production side in the place of those other products. Now, class, a cell phone is no substitute in consumption for a computer especially if you're typing like a 40-page research paper.
Okay, it doesn't have the battery life. You're going to ruin your eyesight doing that. Similarly, a small short paper is best used on a laptop, but a desktop is needed for a, if you're having to be on the computer for the next several days and can't turn it off. Laptops will get fried if you're on them too long. A desktop is bigger and they have better heat ventilation than a laptop does. And so my point is these are poor substitutes of consumption, but they are great substitutes in production. And that's why Apple makes all those products. They can increase production of one product and reduce the other. Now, some folks say, well, why don't they just make more? Well, how many factories do you think Apple owns? How many factories do you think that Apple is subcontracting to make their phones? And do you think those factories would be sitting there doing nothing if they didn't have a contract from Apple? No, they'd have a, a contract with Samsung. They'd have a contract with Toshiba. They'd have a contract with some other company. So the thing is, Apple can't just call this factory up and say, hey, do you have some spare assembly line space for us? They'll probably say, no, we've got a contract with Samsung right now. Call us when that contract expires in six months. There is a limited available production base for Apple to make its products. And so for Apple to increase production of the iPhone, they have to reduce the production of their other products. They must substitute in production. So the price of iPhones goes up. The supply of the other products Apple makes shifts left because they are substitutes in production. Now, what happens when supply shifts with no change in demand? Here are two examples. One with supply shifting right, the other with it shifting left. Keep in mind, time-lapse photography. Also keep in mind, I prefer that the color of the shifted curve be blue. Don't use green, don't use red. Use blue for the shifted curve. You've bl use black pen or gray pencil for the original equilibrium, and these should be dollar signs. So first of all, the market for beer, like St. Arnold. Suppose all else being equal, the government reduces the alcoholic beverage excise tax. Remember, you have to pay the excise tax to sell the beer. If the cost of the excise tax is lower, Brock Wagner, president of St. Arnold's, can buy more hops and grain, he can hire more brewery workers, and he can start to increase production of beer, and not just him. The folks over there at Carvac, the folks at Back Pew, the folks at 11 Below, the folks at all those breweries can start increasing production because production costs are dropping thanks to lower excise taxes. So the supply curve shifts to the right due to changes in government factors affecting production costs. Now, as supply shifts right, the equilibrium point shifts diagonally down to the right. The equilibrium price decreases. Notice P prime is closer to zero than P star. And the equilibrium quantity increases. Q prime is farther from zero than Q star. Here's a second example. Suppose we're looking at the market for gasoline. Suppose all else being equal, the price of crude oil. Crude oil is the natural land resource we harvest from under the earth. Crude oil is used to make gasoline. It is the most important resource used to produce gasoline. You can't make gasoline without having crude oil. If crude oil becomes more expensive, refineries are going to have to cut back. They have limited budgets in the short run, remember. They have to buy less crude oil and therefore make less gasoline no matter what the price is. So the supply of gasoline starts to decrease. It shifts to the left as the cost of a necessary resource increases. So notice as supply shifts to the left from S to S prime, we have a diagonal up and to the left movement of the equilibrium point. As that equilibrium point is moving diagonally up and to the left, the equilibrium price is rising. It's getting farther from zero, so gas is now more expensive to the consumer. And notice there's less gasoline bought and sold. The new Q prime is to the left of the old Q star. It's closer to zero and therefore smaller. Okay. All righty, so I'm going to stop sharing this here. Let me go back over to here. Now, this video is for both micro and macro students. I'm going to do a second video to supplement this one in a few minutes where I'm going to work through the first four of the practice problems that are on the unit one practice problem set. They're the same group of practice problems for both classes, but let me just show you how they look here. For the macro students here, actually, let me go back to screen sharing here. Hold on a second. And sorry for the tunnel effect, y'all. I'm going to go down and open up your practice problem set here. And that one is called Unit 1 Practice Problems. For all the macro students, this is on the second page here. You notice we have graph practice with supply and demand shifters. We're going to work these first four over here, chicken wings, chemical soap, used cars, and dental services. And we're going to do those in a separate video that I'm going to be posting a little later today. Now, for the micro students, give me one moment to open this thing up here. 
Those are letters A, B, C, and D from your Unit 1 practice problems for problem four. Okay, for the micro students, it's letters A, B, C, and D. Now, y'all will notice that in both groups of practice problems, there are a total of like about 11 or 12 different practice problems. And the way these problems are designed, folks, is that um, only one curve is going to shift. We will not have both curves shifting simultaneously because it produces an indeterminate result. If I had both supply and demand shift right at the same time, we know for sure quantity at equilibrium would increase, but price would go up or go down or stay the same, depending upon which one shifts more. Folks, when both curves shift, whichever one shifts more dominates the effect on equilibrium, which means it's going to be the result as if only that one curve moved. Okay. Similarly, if both supply and demand were to decrease, we know for sure quantity at equilibrium would decrease, but price would go up or down depending on which one shifts further left. If supply shifts further left and demand moves, equilibrium price will go up. If, if demand shifts further left than supply does, equilibrium price will go down. If they shift to the same degree, there's no change in equilibrium price at all. I don't like these types of situations where you're not sure which one is going to move more. I prefer to deal with what's more reasonable. Simplest model explains things the best. And so what that means for y'all is having a, a market. And folks, this is each individual problem I'm talking about. In each individual problem, it's either demand shifting for that problem or supply shifting for that problem, but not both. And so your goal is to figure out which curve moves what direction, and that tells you what happens to equilibrium. But you have to also figure out which non-price determinant is causing it, and you gotta be specific. Like if it's the price of another good related to consumption, well, are they complementary goods or are they substitutes of consumption? Okay. Similarly, if it's a government factor affecting production costs, is it an excise tax or is it regulations? Again, you got to get to the details of it. Okay. So I'm going to do the other video a little later today, but this is to help you get started. For macro students, this is going to help you with problem number five on the handwritten homework for unit one. And a lot of this stuff is covered in chapter three. Okay. And this is talking about McConnell and Brew, and I believe it's also chapter three for Schiller. For the micro students, same chapter, this is related to problem number three on the handwritten homework. Uh, micro students have got two other problems that do not overlap with macro, and the same thing happens with macro as well. Thus far, I've covered material for all five macro homework problems, but I've got two more topics to cover for micro after I get the other video up. Students, I hope uh, everything is going well for y'all. I hope you're getting your houses repaired and you're getting ready to go back to class. Uh, Lone Star College will go back to class on September the 5th on Tuesday. Uh, HCC will go back to class on Monday, September the 11th, which is the following week. I wish you all success on this. Please make sure you watch these videos and take notes. Please attempt to work the practice problems. These videos are being made available for y'all to help you cover the missed material and maybe as a supplement to my lectures as well. Thank you very much and I'll see y'all soon.